All right, and that is on record. So anything you can uh, you say now will be uh, held against you in a court of law, most likely. We should be all right. Okay, just uh, give a quick intro. It's uh, Mark on the 24th of March 2017, just going through uh, the second learner guide in the new counselling diploma, CHCCSL002. Uh, uh, that is the the replacement of the old you know, CHCCSL 502A 502 uh, for the people in the old stuff. Uh, very similar in, in, in setup, uh, still dealing with communication and the counselling interview. And okay, I've got someone else coming in. Just see if that works. Oh, it's Bri hey, Bridget. Bridget's on mute. Might want to unmute yourself, Bridget. Okay. Uh, yep, there you are. Yep, loud and clear. All good. Good. All right. I just good kicked morning. Off. Good morning. I just kicked off. I'll uh, I'll probably do a little bit of a monologue for a while, but I'll bring you guys in as well if you got questions. And and if you got questions and I go too fast, just uh, you know, just interrupt me bluntly. Hey, uh, I don't I don't mind. And then uh, we'll stop and stand okay. still. So I'll uh, I'll keep going. So this uh, this unit, the old 502A for you as well, Brigitte. Uh, that's that's the old one. Um, it hasn't changed much, to be honest. Uh, it's still about the same stuff. And, and as I'm going through my master's in counselling at the moment, it's back to basics. You know, and the, the first subject I'm doing in my master's is advanced counselling skills, they call it. But it's all communication stuff, back to the micro skills, back to communication, how to communicate, um, how to not communicate, how to be aware of what you communicate in counselling and, and, and in real life, obviously. And, and how to be very careful as a professional communicator is, you know, that's what we are becoming or already are. Uh, people communicate always, you, know, you can't help it. Even just by looking at someone you're communicating. Uh, in this case, we're trying to professionally communicate and actually make it a skill. So this, this workshop, this session, this training session, if you will, is just a quick rundown on uh, 002, that unit. Nothing too in-depth. I just want to point out a couple of things that I know are really important for the people who will start off on this unit uh, afresh, not like uh, you two, Dale and Brigitte, who are transitioning. So the people that start off fresh and haven't seen this, I'll point a couple of things out that I really think are important to uh, to remember. And I think we'll be done in about half an hour, 40, 45 minutes. So I'll just go through it. Any questions, just ask. Hopefully, Brigitte, you can see uh, the book on your screen as well, the Learner Guide. Is that correct? Yes, I can see yep. them. Okay. Very small. Yeah, it's. I know it's small. You should be able so to. So then maybe click them. You should be able to blow things up a little bit. Sometimes you can do full screen or, or something. If not, oh, yeah. 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 I can... will try to figure out. Okay, cool. All righty. Now, I won't go into the readings. I'll just go through the, the sections because that'll be uh, most helpful anyway. And uh, again, if you have any questions, you two, just uh, interrupt me. That's uh, all good. Uh, and for your information, but again, this thing will be uh, recorded, obviously, as long as you know, uh, and then it's all good. Yeah, I'm on to it. Cool. All righty. So this uh, learner guide consists of uh, four sections, as do most actually. Introduction to effective communication, uh, then the micro skills and counselling interview, specialist skills that we'll go into a little bit, and then counselling practice. Now, that last section, this bit, I probably won't talk about too much. I want to uh, sort of stand still with, uh, with the, the micro skills and the communication skills a little bit more, as that's, that's the most important thing you'll ever learn. Um, we had a, I had a lecture yesterday. Uh, and my, my prof, my professor, doctor guy or whatever he is, he said, look, counselling um, has been proven in research you know, to be effective no matter what therapy you use really. Or, or let me put it this way. He says it doesn't matter what technique you use. Uh, all techniques, whether you use person-centered, whether you use cognitive behavioral stuff, whether you use negative, gestalt, whatever, solution focus, you mention them. All uh, therapies are proven to be effective in research. Uh, but one not more than any other. You know, so the, it shows in in, uh, in multiple research uh, findings that most, well, no, not all therapies are effective to pretty much the same degree. So uh, that that leads us to two conclusions: uh, psychotherapy or counselling is an effective tool, yeah, you know, because it it does have a major effect. Uh, people that just stick with going to the GP uh, for mental health issues will have less results or, or fewer results than people that combine a visit with uh, to the GP with actual counselling. 
Yeah, so counseling definitely helps, psychotherapy slash counseling. But what he said as well, uh, you know, our lecturer, he said, the most important thing, regardless of the technique you use, is your communication skills. He says communication skills and, and the way you communicate with clients will pretty much make for uh, close to 70% of the outcome of counseling. And and that's that's for me it's not something I didn't know already, but that the way he put it into context uh, with research and, and all sorts of other findings and the way we discussed it was sort of a, an eye opener again for me. Like I said, even though I knew it already, um, it sort of re-emphasised the fact that the relationship we have with our clients, you know, the therapeutic relationship as we often call it, is the most important thing. You know, it, it is for counselling success. And how do you build that one? Well, you built that by communication. You just can't help it. Yeah? And obviously, this is a professional form of communication. Like I said, we always communicate. This is a professional form of it. But you know, from Carl Rogers uh, in, in the 50s to now, it's been pretty much proven that the way we communicate and the way we built that alliance with our clients is the, the biggest contributing factor to therapeutic outcomes. And, and that's as academic as I'll get. So just to, to drive home the point that for you guys to work on this unit and even for you, Brigitte and Dale, even though you've done this one already in 502, to go do it again and to keep working on those micro skills is probably the most important skill you'll ever learn in counseling. And, and I, that sounds a bit dramatic, but I think it's, it's pretty much true. You know, being able to communicate properly, to, to be with a client, to be there and listen to them, to allow them to have their story unfold, to allow them to, to share things no matter how ridiculous they seem, you know, it, that's the, the biggest thing. You know, when people go away and they felt they've been listened to, um, you'll get the biggest outcome. So that, that's all I'm going to say about that. This is a really important unit. That's that's pretty much what I'm saying. All right, here we go. Now, reading A, just go through it at your own leisure. Now, for the beginning bit, uh, I'll just suffice to say that you, know, you can't help but communicate in counselling you know, or in, in life. Everything you do is communication. Whether you say something or do something, everything is a form of communication. Now, the components... Just for the people that will do this uh, unit afresh, um, for you guys, transition students, it's not that big of an issue because you're only doing the practical bit, but you'll need to know the components of communication. Now, just as a little bit of a test, ladies, um, can you still remember the components of communication other than the source and, and the messages, obviously? Can you still remember a couple? I know it's a bit of a trick question putting you on the spot here. Can you still remember what they were? Um, noise. Noise is one. Yeah, it's definitely. A, yeah, that's definitely a, a contributor. Yeah, what else? I know I'm putting you on the spot. It's not fair. Feedback. Getting feedback. Feedback is a big one. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, the channels of communication. How do you actually communicate? And obviously, there's things like context. You know, the context in which the communication takes place. You know, is it out on the street? Is it after a big fight? You know, is it in your counselling office? Uh, is it casually uh, over dinner, or wherever? You know, we'll always make uh, make big differences. So we'll go through them. So yep, noise and feedback are definitely in there. The channels, context, and obviously the rules. You know, what are the rules to communication? Um, me being a European, you know, different rules for communication and and ways we communicate probably than in Australia, and different again in America, and different again in the UK. You know, so there will be certain rules that we stick to generally that other people might not stick to, you know? uh, don't speak before your turn, you know? don't interrupt people or, or maybe do interrupt people, it just depends on the context. Alright, so that's an easy one, I actually like these little pictures, so again just pause the recording if you ever want to look at them or better yet just flick open your own learner guide and go through it. Now there is a lot of stuff, uh, it's more academic stuff on encoding, you know, encoding and decoding. Um, the, the way we interpret information that comes from people is decoding. We decode what they've said and what they've done or how they've acted. And obviously the way we try and get a message across to a client is a form of encoding. You know, so if you've got something to say to a client, the way you do that is the way you encode your message. Do you do that visually you know, with, you know, with smiling eyes? Do you do that behaviorally by just using your hands? Do you do that verbally only you know, by just saying words and how do you use those words? And be careful, hey, 
in, in neurolinguistics, when I started off in neurolinguistics, uh, the, the sort of golden rule was always if a person doesn't understand you, it's on you to, to change your communication, not on the other person to try and understand you better, if that makes sense. Yeah, if, if you are in a therapeutic relationship with someone and they don't seem to grasp what it is that you're saying, then you have the responsibility to rephrase your message or to, to say it in a different way so that the client understands or the person you're communicating with. It's not on to the listener to just try harder, you know, especially in, in a professional relationship. And I've always stuck that, you know, I've sort of always stuck that way when in my brain and go like, yep, okay, always check in with your clients to see if they still understand what you're talking about because you could have a uh, on the surface a really good conversation but both live in parallel worlds. Yeah, and your client might come away with, I didn't really understand a word this guy was talking about. And you thought you had a brilliant session. Yeah, and I've had that, uh, trust me, where you think you were the boss. You know, I was like, man, that was a cool session. And your client goes away and rings you and said, it didn't make any sense at all to me. Now, that's on me. You know, that was my responsibility to do better, to get off my little arrogant you know, plateau of complacency and, and listen to the client or ask them if they actually understand what I'm talking about. So it's, it's very important. So encoding, decoding, won't go too much into that. It's very academic. But just be aware of the fact that we all have different ways of uh, delivering our message and that people have different ways of interpreting the message. And up to us in our professional conversation is to find out what the preferred way of uh, decoding of our client is. And that's where things like visual, auditory, uh, reading, writing, and kinesthetic learning comes in. You know, some clients will learn best if you just act it out for them or draw it out on a piece of paper. Others are quite easy just listening to you. Uh, others want to see it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And others just want to read about it. And yeah, that's fine. Make sure that you understand what your clients are all about. All right, communication barriers. Okay, put you on the spot again, ladies. Can you still remember a couple, apart from the environmental that's showing? Yes. Language. Absolutely. Yeah, what else? Culture. Culture, yeah, could definitely, yeah, big one. Can definitely be a big one. What else? Oh, if somebody's got, like, um, a disability, like, um, who's, a bit autistic or has on that spectrum yep intellectual or physical hey disability in general uh, can be a massive contributor to communication barriers absolutely yep and then there's things like intense emotions that might be a barrier you know you just can't listen you can't hear them anymore because you're so caught up in your own grief or anger or whatever that you just don't listen anymore that that happens quite often uh, it could be a physical barrier, you know, just uh, you know, the counsellor taking notes or a physical barrier is in you know, standing too far away from each other to actually hear uh, or more things like you know, male-female barriers it's like, well, you know, we live on Mars and you guys live on, on, on Venus, you know, that sort of stuff. It's like you're just, in, you're just incomprehensible and that could go either way, obviously. Hey, it's like, I really don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, the the, cl the classic one is that that women try to sort things out by talking about it, you know, and they don't need a solution. It's just the talking about it that actually you know, is is enough. Whereas us guys are always looking for solutions for things. You know, we try and solve problems. It's a classic, and be careful in your own counselling style as well. You know, and I've seen that happen where I would get female clients come in. And you know, they say, oh, look, you know, I'm feeling a bit depressed and I've got some issues with my husband or whatever it is. You know, it doesn't matter. I'm just picking a topic. Go like, oh, right, okay, so what do you want to do about it? You know? And she sort of looks at me. That's obviously an hour-long session. She said, well, I don't necessarily need to do anything about it. I just want to talk about it. <laughs> and you go, oh, okay. And you know, in, the, in my beginning years, it's like, well, what's the use of that? You know, well, why would you want to talk about it if you don't want to solve it? And, and that goes both ways. So in general, when you as a, as a female counsellor you know, will encounter men, uh, don't go into the let's talk about this mode too much because probably the guy just wants to solve his issue. And if you help him solve it, you'll be the best counsellor on the planet and he'll come back time and time again. You know, if, you, if you get too much in a conversation about it, he'll probably walk off because it's a massive communication barrier for him. It's like she did, just didn't understand me. She just wanted to talk about stuff and I still have my problem. So it didn't help. You know, you'll get that sort of comment. And obviously, that's that's a very popular sort of book, popular as in it's not necessarily scientific, but there's definitely a piece of truth to it. Communication barriers can make it really hard to uh, 
to have a good counselling relationship, so you need to be aware of them and try and avoid them or take care of them as much as possible. All right, here we go. Next next bit. Let's go through this pretty quick. More barriers, language barriers. You can just read through that at your own leisure. Um, Mark. Yep, hit me. Um, I was just thinking, like you were just saying about how men, they don't like to, they just like to get to goals. So, therefore, in the um, initial um, counselling session then, what? How do you approach it then? Do you just do your, um, you know, your intro and all that sort of stuff, get their story, and then just basically um, go to what? What do you want to get out of this, basically? Um, in short, uh, you know, without the nuances, yes. Yeah, you know, there's, there's obviously nuances to it, but that's that's what I would probably do. Yeah. Okay. And it depends a bit, you know, it's, it's a constant checking in of a counsellor to, to find out what the style of that guy is, because you might actually come across, well, let's let's label him a feminine type guy, you know, a guy with, with a very in touch with his feminine side, so he might actually want to talk about it, you know, yeah. so don't judge a book by its cover, yeah. but, you know, across the board, sweeping statement, yes, you know, as soon as the guy's done his story in general, get to the question like, okay, what do you want to do about this, or how can we help you know, what can we do to, to solve this issue for you? Or ask questions along those lines, you know. Or what would be a way for you that would take care of this problem uh, forever? You know? Or um, what can I do to help? Okay. Or what sounds like solution? But again, always check in. Because, you know, I do get the male clients that, that come in and just want to do their story and that's it. You know, because they've never had someone listening to them the way they're talking now, and that, that's cool. And I've had women come in and said, man, you know, just give me a solution for this stupid problem. So, well, I can't do that, but we can talk about it. You know, so so don't make judgments, you know, and that's that's something that always comes back in any unit. Just yeah. don't don't assume things, you know. <laughs> you, you, can definitely, you can definitely use your professional expertise to... Uh, see certain tendencies, and that's that's always fine. But don't consider them black and white, please. You know, because it's not always the case. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Does that does that make sense? I know I'm, I'm sort of uh, beating around the bush a little bit, but it's there's no blacks and whites. Yeah, no, that does make sense. Thanks, Mark. Okay. All right. The counselling interview. Now, like I said, if you, if you learn nothing else, nothing else in your whole 18 months or 12 months for the new diploma, but your micro skills, if you learn nothing else, you'll be an awesome counsellor. Yeah, if if you learn this and learn it well, you'll do just fine. Because like I said, about seventy percent of, or well, anywhere between sixty and seventy percent of therapeutic outcome, is based on doing this correctly. Yeah, and it's it's massive. You know, I don't know how how much I can emphasise to make sure that you understand how massive it is, but it is. Um, Carl Rogers, you should all know his name. Uh, he's he's a classic. You know, person-centred therapy. Um, I tell my students, I pretty much tell everyone that no matter what therapy you use, you will always have to use person-centered therapy. Yeah, so even if you become a cognitive behavioral expert, uh, even if you just want to focus on solution-focused therapy, or if you just want to focus on, I don't know, whatever, uh, dialectical behavior therapy or on narrative therapy, you must know your person-centered therapy because we're dealing with persons. And, and the micro skills in the counselling interview is, is, is part of that. So, again, yeah, highlighted yellow, red, green, whatever colour, this is important stuff. Oh, actually, can I do that? I think I can. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just highlighted it. So, learn Thank this. You. Oh, man, it's awesome. <laughs> so, make sure you understand this stuff. Now, in practicals, and I'm talking for everyone, and I'm talking for myself as well, as much as I'm talking for and to you guys, you never stop learning. I still stuff up when it comes to micro skills. Or no, that's, that's that's not the right way of saying. It. I'm not stuffing up. There's still more to learn. Let's put it that way. It's not a matter of stuffing up. It's just constantly honing your skills further and further and further. Now the light blue book uh, that you should all have: intentional interviewing and counselling. You know the Ivy and Ivy Bible, if you will. Uh, that all deals with um, with micro skills and and how to develop them. And they have a book written on that and. I actually got it in front of me. That's worth close to 450 pages just on micro skills, on how to communicate properly with, with clients. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, it's the Bible when it comes to uh, to this stuff. You, know, you want to have that book, not necessarily to read it as a, as a good sort of just before go to bed, bedtime story kind of stuff, but as reference material because you'll be using it. I still use it. Um, 
Now they come up with a with a five stage model. You know, it's uh, and you can you can see that in there. Um, uh, it's it's a model that's used quite frequently, and it's a good model. Uh, it works a treat. You know, you develop the relationship. You know, you do the stories and strength stuff. You do the goal setting. Then you do the restoring, as in you know, working on it, and ultimately you'll come up with some form of action. Um, there was another uh, lady, uh, not another lady. There was a lady who actually came up with a, a more three-step based model, which was a little bit easier to do uh, than the, the Ivy and Ivy one. It's called the skilled helper model as well. Um, it's like a storytelling, finding out needs and wants, and then you know, implementing action strategies. And, and that's pretty much what you'll do through each session, but also as part of your whole session package, if that makes sense. You know, your whole session package, if you see someone uh, anywhere between six and ten sessions, the first two and three might be on actually letting the story come out. Yeah. And then the, the second set of three might be on, okay, what are we going to do about this? And then the last two or three might be, okay, let's do something about this now. You know, what can we do? But each session as such, in a sense, is similar. You know, each session individually is, okay, gather some more information. You know, see where the client's at after the session. You know, what, we, what do you want to focus on now in terms of a problem? And what do you want to do about it? So it goes for the big umbrella, but it also goes for each element underneath, if that makes sense. And if you can keep that in mind, you know, during your sessions, you can't go wrong. You'll always structure it correctly. Yeah, it's okay. Tell me your story. How did you go between you know, last session and now? You know, what are some remaining problems, and what can we do about it? Yeah, just keep that in mind. All right. Now that's all very interesting. The five-stage model. Read up in Ivy and Ivy. I'm not going to do that too much. Just read up on it. There's plenty of stuff in there. All right. Attending behavior. Remember that, girls. Attending behavior. The three V's and B. Yeah. Remember, remember those? Yep. Yep. Okay. Visual, vocal, and verbal. Yeah. And then behavior, obviously. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to do a workshop on that one uh, soon again, I think, online, where we'll get everyone to actually uh, become uh, visual as well, and we'll do it. Uh, it's all about uh, you know, trying to be congruent with your clients, you know, visually, vocally, and verbally, and in your behavior. Now, that's obviously culturally determined where you can run really cool workshops where we have people just do exactly the opposite of what's expected. And it makes for a really stupid conversation. You know, because if you uh, are pretending to be a client and you talk to someone who's constantly distracted or, or just, you know, does something that, that seems so off, you'll actually have a really bad conversation going on. It's hilarious when you do that in a workshop setting because people just, just feel so misunderstood. And that's that's often what happens. Okay, I'm not going to stop too too much here. Three V's and B, Ivy and Ivy, read up on it. Or oh, in here, obviously, there's there's plenty of information on it. Observation, you know, verbal and nonverbal behavior. You've got to be aware of that. Um, in neurolinguistics, neurolinguistic programming, which I studied as well, there's a strong emphasis on on matching and mirroring what they call it. You know, trying to stay with your client by roughly behaving the same way. Like if you've ever gone into a, a cafe or a bar where you see guys standing you know, at the bar with a beer in the hand, often they, they stand the same way. You know, they, they'll be leaning against the bar with a beer in one hand and an elbow in the other. And, and often it's that they'll cross one foot over the other and just stand there. Now, they got great rapport, as it's called, you know, because they're, they're, lean, they're just leaning the same way, literally and figuratively speaking. And it's not a it's not a law. It's not always true, but there's very much you know wisdom in trying to sort of match your client's behaviour every now and then. So if they seem to use their hands quite often, well, use your hands a little bit more. You know, uh, if they talk fast, well, talk a bit faster yourself. You know, if they use simple words, well, try and use simple words yourself. You know, try and, and move that, and be be very aware of, of annoying behaviours as well. Hey, uh, like clicking your pens or tapping your fingers or whatever. I I don't like those. It, it takes away from the session. So there's a lot on that one. Read that. Um, okay, this uh, mirroring. Um, oh yeah, mirroring is is the stuff that I was talking about. That's that's often what you can do. Have a read of that one. It's it's interesting stuff. Now, questioning, then we'll go a little bit deeper into that one. Obviously, open and close questions. I'll make a note of that one because that's what I see um, done, let's call it, uh, insufficiently in practicals quite often where too many people, and I, I stick my hand up, 
too many close questions. You know, it's like, have you, are you, did you, um, would you like to, uh, where is it? You know, simple answers. Uh, generally, that doesn't allow for a good conversation with clients. You know, the, the words that you want to ram in your head and want to start every question with are uh, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Yeah, you know, who, what, where, when, how, why, and how. And I think a good exercise, and that, that goes for you two as well still, is to uh, try and, and try it out in, in general practice. Try and ask only open questions of everyone. You know, so uh, did, you, did you come in late yesterday evening? No, instead of that, ask what time did you come in yesterday evening? Or... Uh, did you put, you know, did you put the, the knife in the drawer? No, don't ask that. Just ask, where did you put it? You know, just make every question that you can ask, make it open. You know, did you actually talk to them? No. What did you say to him? You know, so it's a good exercise to actually you know, get your open questioning going is just to, to force yourself to do it in, in, you know, in, in normal casual conversation. Try and open up every question with a what, where, why, when, how. It's, it's tricky. But it can be done, and it's it's interesting because it does allow for you know, what they call here deep exploration. You know, it, it just makes the conversation so much easier. Uh, a problem I see students have in practicals as well quite often is that they can't get to the half hour mark. It's like, oh, my practical is only 20 minutes. Like, well, that to me just means that you haven't asked enough open questions. It's really simple often. You know, just get the story out. In a, in a popular way, I always say, look, make this a Sherlock Holmes inquiry you know, just get the story out just more Sherlock Holmes more questions more questions there's always more that you can learn from clients because that gives you as a counselor you know the bigger picture and that allows you to come up with a good case conceptualization and then also a good way of helping that client forward any questions on that for you too or all clear no no yeah, all clear good all right Yes. Ways you can go wrong with that, obviously, is bombarding and grilling. You know, I've done that. You know, question after question after question after question. You know, and, and multiple questions in one sentence. You know, Where did you go and what did you do? Well, that's you know, too many questions or questions as statements. Well, you must, you must have felt really bad, didn't you? That's really a statement. It's not a, it's not a question, really. Yeah. Now, why is a tricky word. Be careful with it. Um, why can be a really good one to, to get more reasoning out, to get reasons for certain things out, but why can also be seem to be really aggressive. You know, or if, if a client tells you something and you go, well, why did you do that? That often, oh, well, actually, they give you that example as well. I didn't even read that. But that's often a question that can be interpreted quite negatively. You know, it's like, well, uh, well I don't know, as if you need to justify yourself, you know, uh, and that's not the point. So... What I often say to students is come up with questions where you cloak the why. You know, for instance, in a way of, uh, can you please tell me why you, why you did that? Or can you tell me the reason why you did that? Or what do you think was the reason for doing that? So skip why altogether. Now, I don't mind using why, but when you do it, be very aware of your own body language when you ask it, uh, of your tone of voice, and um, try and make it more like an inquiry question rather than a, a sort of, you know, a spotlight question, putting the spotlight on someone interrogating them. why, you know, why can be, uh, can be a bad one. There's a lot of research on that one, so careful with why. All the other open questions, the what, where, how, and who are great. Now, double-barreled questions, yeah, okay, read up on that, very interesting. Responding skills, all right, now we're getting into the meaty part of things. Um, encourages paraphrases and summarize, summaries. Uh, Ivy and Ivy will be your Bible to go to, again, because there's lots of that. There's, I think, on each, there's about 20 pages or something, you know, just on an encourages, paraphrases, and summaries. Now, use them. I don't know if you ever saw, and it's for the both of you, but also for other people listening, the Gloria videos uh, of Carl Rogers. Yeah. Yep, yeah. you've seen them? Awesome yeah. stuff. Now, yeah. Gloria was a, was a lady who in the 60s, I think it was 1965, but it can be a couple of years off, uh, somewhere in the 60s anyway, uh, who volunteered to be interviewed for counseling by, by three guys, uh, Albert Ellis, you know, Rational Emotive Therapy, um, Fritz Perls, who was the guy behind Gestalt Therapy, and Carl Rogers, who was you know, up and coming in, in person-centered therapy. 
and she would discuss her, her issues with these three guys, same issue, uh, three different fellas, but they would each use their specific technique or their specific style of account style of psychotherapy on, on Gloria. And Gloria is probably obviously a made up name, but the, the videos are real. And it's fascinating to, to watch, uh, especially Carl Rogers. I think the outcome was that you know, she liked Carl Rogers the best, but didn't necessarily think he you know, provided her with much of a solution, which you know, is, is typical of person-centered therapy. It doesn't steer towards solutions. Uh, she thought Fritz Perls with his Gestalt therapy was the most effective in, in helping her. And Albert Ellis, she thought, was a bit of an idiot. She didn't say it that way, but she didn't really like what he was doing. It was a bit too harsh on her, I believe. But it's fascinating on YouTube. Do a do a search on YouTube. Just type in Gloria and then put Gloria Carl Rogers, and, and they'll come up. They're fascinating, fascinating pieces of video. Even though they're 50 years old or 52 years old, absolutely fascinating stuff. As you'll see, for instance, that Carl Rogers is the king of encouragers. Yeah, to a point that we uh, we watched one yesterday actually in in class, and uh, he says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to the point that I actually start finding it really annoying. But he's he's so good at it, uh, he's he's really good. And she just kept talking. Yeah, you know, he didn't say much. He didn't say much at all. And he constantly paraphrased and reflected things back to her, and just kept saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah, people were you know, this this lady just kept talking, and she actually got you know, quite deep into what what ultimately was the biggest issue in in her case. And it's it's fascinating to watch. I won't give you uh, the plot nor the plot twist or whatever. Just go watch it. It's it's interesting stuff. So encourages are easy. Yeah, you know, encourage is a good tool to use to keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm, is a good one. Tell me more. Uh, things like, oh, really? Or, oh, cool. Or just anything that verbally sort of acknowledges the client, you know, that you know what they're saying and just keep doing it. Again, don't do it to the point of, of completely annoying anyone else, but, you know, to keep the conversation going is cool. Now, paraphrasing is, you remember, reflection of content. Oh, I don't need that. Well, let's get that out of the way. Oh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Paraphrasing is reflection of content, hey? So if yeah. in this case example here, uh, she tells you a story and you just pretty much paraphrase the content. So if she if she says something, you say, well, okay, you feel much better after breaking up with Jason because that's the sentence. Great, then you've paraphrased it. What does that do? Well, what, what does that do in, in the conversation? Just give me an idea. Well, it shows that um, she was listening, the, count, the counselor was listening. Yeah, exactly, that's it. Yeah, it, it shows that you're with them. And then that's if you read Carl Rogers' uh, articles, and, and there's, there's, oh, there's so many on them, he says that's the most important thing, you know, that empathetic, attentive relationship with your client and uh, being there with them, the presence, as he calls it. If you have presence with your clients, you get the best results. And yeah, paraphrasing is one really cool way to show that presence because you have to be listening in order to paraphrase correctly. Yeah, it's, it's just it's like simple. You can't paraphrase them unless you're listening. So that's that's a good one to throw in. It's a really tough one, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, even I still do it too little, and and I see students do it too little in in practicals as well. More, more, more of it. You just keep doing more of it. Yeah, you know, just keep practicing on that one. Do it in in casual conversation as well. Yeah, you know, it's it's a good one. I'm not going into the the details of it, but I uh, just want to emphasize it. Summarizing. Okay, how is summarizing different from uh, paraphrasing and reflecting? You remember? Sil silence. Oh. Oh. Like there, you said it was just a statement, is yeah. paraphrasing, but um, summarizing is more detailed. Yeah, exactly. Summarizes, summarizing is actually a form of reflecting or paraphrasing. It's just there's more in there. Yeah, you know, so you do it a little bit later in the piece. Um, if if someone tells you a paragraph, you know they say something, then you can pretty much paraphrase or reflect the feeling back. Uh, you can only summarize after you've heard a couple of those paragraphs. You know, so a summary is something that generally starts with, "Let me see if I got this right." You know, "Let me see if I heard you correctly," or "Okay, let's let's just sum up what we've discussed over the last ten minutes." You know, this this and this happened. You felt that that and that, and you would like to do this this and this about it. Is that correct? Okay, cool. Yeah, again, you can only summarize if you're listening, and it helps. You know, because sometimes in the communication, uh, things might go wrong. 
you know, you might not have heard something correctly or the client might have said something that you've interpreted you know, differently. Summarizing is a good way, first of all, to show the client you're still listening, but also to maybe get uh, early communication disruptions out of the way. You know, because if, if you haven't heard them correctly, and I get that every now and then, it's like, okay, let me see if I got this right, this, this, and this. And the client goes, oh, no, I didn't say that. So, oh, okay, sorry. What did you say? What, what was going on? And then you can get a, you know, an early uh, change of, of course. Whereas if I just assume that I've heard them correctly and just keep going, uh, we might start running parallel tracks and then I lose my client. You know, it, it doesn't doesn't work that way. So summarizing is a good way. Again, in practicals, do it more often. Focus on it because we still do it not often enough. And like I said, everything I tell you guys, I'm sticking my hand up as much because I can still learn more. Noting and reflecting. You know, reflecting is, is an easy one. Uh, it's, it's like paraphrasing, but it's more a, you know, a feeling one. So you, you, know, you, you reflect back to the client how they felt. You know, generally, I say, oh, okay, the story comes out and say, oh, look, look, you must have felt really, you know, you must have felt really angry, or you must have felt really bad about that. Now, our lecturer, that's sort of funny to mention, in the Ivy and Ivy book, they actually make quite a point of um, naming the emotion that you think your client is expressing, even though they aren't. You know, so if they say, oh, man, I got so mad and this and that happened, it's like, man, I was bursting out of my skin, blah, blah, blah. And then if you would reflect back what Ivy and Ivy would uh, suggest to you, say, well, you must have been really angry. Now, that could be the right emotion, but it could also have been frustration. Now, you don't know. Um, our lecturer said, he says, the only way, the only type that I go off, you know, Ivy and Ivy as a book is, is in actually labeling that emotion. Now, have your own idea about that. What he says is like you can probably, you can summarize it in a more uh, general way where you say, look, oh, that, that must have brought up strong feelings for you, didn't it? Yeah, it's still good. It's still a good reflection or still a good reflection of feeling, but you're not labeling that emotion. So you can't you can't go wrong. Otherwise, you have to make a sort of a, you know, an educated guess. And you could be wrong in your guess. And that sometimes puts clients off. So have your own ideas about that, whether you want to actually label that feeling or whether you just want to be more generic and say, well, look, I can see that you felt strongly about that. You know, is is a reflection that still says it, but at least you're not labeling it as much as, oh, you must have been really angry. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, way to do reflecting is like, uh, you feel and name the emotion. Now, that's Ivy and Ivy, <laughs> my lecturer, you know, who's been a counselor for I don't know how long and actually works at the university, says, well, he wouldn't name the emotion. He said, no, you feel strongly about this or yeah, I can, I can see that this actually brought up strong feelings inside you. you know, he would not label it. Up to you. There's no right and wrong necessarily in there. Find your own way. It's just two ways of doing stuff. Okay, the feeling wheel, I like this one. Just again, look in your own learner guide. I actually quite like this. It allows you to, if you want to use the, the terms, it allows you to pick a couple in, in certain sort of bigger categories. So if, you, you know, if you're talking at mad, for instance, well, you can talk about hurt, hostile, angry, rage, hateful, etc., and then have maybe even sub emotions under there. Uh, I, I quite like it. I think I'm going to print it off. I haven't seen this one for a while. All right, client feedback. Yeah, you can read up on that one. That's all good. That's that's a summary. Yeah, so attending behavior, massively important. Person-centered therapy, I'll summarize that as well. If, if the only thing you learn is to communicate with your clients properly, you already got about 60% of the therapeutic outcome in your pocket. That's how important it is, yeah, being able to communicate properly with your clients. Yeah, observe your client, observe yourself, use the right questioning techniques. Use correct responding, do some noting and reflecting, yeah, and give clients feedback, but you can read up on that one. Silence, big one as well. If you ever watch the Gloria videos, and I think you must, you should, you really have to, you got to, uh, you'll hear Carl Rogers, oh yeah, that sounds weird, but you'll hear Carl Rogers use a lot of silences. And at some point, and I'm, I've never been a good one with silence, uh, yeah, but I'm learning. <laughs> Uh, he uses it really smartly. He just sits there and nods his head, you know, encourager, goes, mm hmm mm hmm And his client, actually, the Gloria lady, goes a bit uncomfortable with that and then keeps talking. And that's exactly what you want, you know, because it's, it allows the client to bring the story out even further. But it's, it's, it's funny to watch because I actually get quite uncomfortable if I watch that video and go, like, oh, man, say something. And he doesn't, you know, uh, but it's, it's a really cool one. 
All right, that's all good. Yep, blah de blah de blah. Uh, section three. Now here, this is the last one I'll cover today, and I'll call it quit. Um, oh, where are we? Challenging. Can you still remember what challenging was in your uh, your 502 specialist communication skills? What do we do when we challenge clients? Is, oh. yeah, uh, is that um, where um, they say something and then you say, um, you know, you're saying this, but... Yep. In, in a way, that's, that's yeah, that's that's one of the, the many ways of doing it. Challenging oh. brings out the inconsistencies between uh, what a client has said or between their behavior and what they've yeah. said. Yes, yeah, that's what oh, I mean. uh, Body language is different. Than exactly. Yep. Uh, yeah, you know, someone is crying at your at your counseling table and say, "No, no, I'm fine." Yeah, and then you, that's that's where you could challenge them really gently, obviously. You said, "Look, just I'm I'm watching you. Know, the tears coming out of your eyes. Yet you tell me you're fine. Like, no. how does that work?" Yeah, you know, that would be a challenge. Or uh, the classic one that uh, I often you know, advise people to do in practice. On the one hand, and then mm. on the other hand, that's a challenge too. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a really cool technique, and I I use it often, especially in relation to body language. You know, very often, people will well they, they they won't lie, but it's like they don't want to let the whole truth come out just yet. But you can see it in their body language. You know, their body is just resisting, you know, them not telling the the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You can see it. You know, they start shuffling their bum, or they stop looking at you, or you know, they start waffling words, or you know, they start to become a bit fidgety with their hands or something, and then they say something it's like, "Hang on, it's like I've, I've ju I'm just noticing a, a change in your behavior here." You know, and in relation to what you just said like can you anything going on for you there you know any specific feelings that come up it's a really cool technique because generally it's like um, um uh, well you know and then you know use the silence and then the story starts coming out or generally anyway or they just bluntly go like no 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 just had an itch or something whatever yeah, and then you you got to catch up on them. Keep an eye on that because generally, if there's a, a discrepancy between the body language and the verbal language, you can bet your bottom dollar that something is is not coming out you know, the way it it could come out. So do this one. It's a good one. Yeah, challenge the possible distortion of reality. Yeah, challenge insufficiently acknowledged strengths, and that's when you look at strengths based counselling. You know, it's like ah, oh, you know, I can't do that. No, oh, why not? Or oh, I've never been able to do that. So well, okay. When were you actually able? Have you been in a situation before and where that you actually had to use skills that you didn't think you had and and you found them in the end? Have you been in situations like that before? So well, yeah, there was that one time. So okay, you know. So you know, if you look at strengths based, you know, there's that whole idea of uh, finding a strengths based in clients, which which you know is very much solution focused, obviously. Yeah, you know, always try and find resources and strengths in clients. And they might say that they haven't got choice, whereas, you know, ultimately we all have choice. Even though it's a tough choice sometimes, we, we always have choice. You know, oh, I can't do that anymore, you know, I'm too old, or, oh, no, I've got a mortgage now, I can't I can't change that anymore. So, well, technically you can, you know, but do you want to? That's that's the question. So you're challenging, it's a cool one. All right, uh, let's go for that one. Focusing, remember what focusing is? Pinpointing things, hey, it's just putting a putting a spotlight on something. You know, it's like, okay, out of everything we discussed today, you know, Dale and Brigitte, you know, what would you like to focus on first? You know, that that'd be a good one to ask. That's a focusing. So it could be on you know the client or the the actual issue, or other people, or you know on on the relationship with the counselor and on feelings you know, in the here and now. Focusing is cool. Um, and that's where your professional capability comes in because often clients will just waffle on and they have all sorts of things. And generally as a defense mechanism, you'll find that people will will go off on tangents because they really don't want to discuss all that sensitive stuff. You know, they just don't want to. And then their subconscious defense mechanisms bring makes them bring up all sorts of stories and all sorts of extra bits and pieces that are really not re that relevant. Yeah, but they'll just bring them up because they sort of, yeah, you know, they sort of don't don't want to touch the hot stuff. Yeah, you know, that's they just don't want to. Then it's your job and say, look, I heard you talk about this, this, and this, and this you know, a little bit earlier, but we seem to have gone off topic on that one. Would you mind if we just bring him back to that? Yeah, and go, oh well, okay then. And then you can get to the juicy bits, you know, which are generally in there. So focusing is a really cool skill to have as well. I won't go into detail, just read up on it, but it's it's one you definitely want to. 
put in your in your toolbox. Reframing, that sort of CBT-ish, hey? very cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral. Uh, try to help people to give a different interpretation you know, to things that have happened. There was a classic in the student uh, in the student assessment guide, I think, where something had happened, or someone got fired, or someone, uh, or actually had a no, not fired, but they had a that bit of bit of a fallout with their boss, yeah, and then they thought they were going to get fired. So the fact that they had a fallout with a boss must have meant that they were going to get fired really shortly. Yeah, can be true, but very often, yeah, you know, it's just a misinterpretation of of facts. And so, well, what else could be going on? Uh, that might have caused this reaction and then think about that well you know the boss might have just had an off day or you know whatever the company might have been in some financial issue or or he had just had you know he just had a bad day in general you know just this there could be all sorts of reasons and helping a client to reframe certain things or to reframe an interpretation could be a useful way to actually start seeing their problem in a different light as well you know, my, my mentor, a lady I go and see fairly often, she's really cool at that. She, she just constantly does that. And her standard question to me is like, what's the payoff? You know, as in, okay, what's the upside of what you're actually telling me? You know, she always gets me with that one. It's like, oh, you know, Gene, I've got this and this and i got problems there and there and that's not working for me and blah, 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 blah. And then her simple question is like, okay, well, what's, what's the payoff, Mark? You go, ah, you with your stupid question again. Now I have to start looking at actually how things are working for me. It's a great way to focus me back on you know, the, the, the other side of the coin, really. So it's, it's a cool tool to have uh, an interpretation. Um, counseling skills in action. Yeah, that's all right. That's all cool. Now, self-disclosure. Uh, how are you going to use that one? Can you remember? Yes. Uh, you give her all an example or experience you had? Yep. Very good. Do it very mindfully and do it very subtly and, and do it very sparingly. <laughs> you know, the, this session is about the client. It's not about you. Uh, our lecturer actually says that he doesn't really do much you know, self-disclosure at all and obviously that's just his opinion. It doesn't matter. But he says be careful about it because very often we have a tendency to make it about us. You know, so the session turns into, uh, oh, well, let me tell you about one story that I had that was very similar to you. And then the counselor starts talking for about 10 minutes. You know, it's, that's not the point. The point is to say, look, I, I can understand how you feel. You know, I went through this uh, similar situation about 10 years ago. And even though I can't understand how you exactly feel because you're different, you know, I know it must be hard. Yeah, that's enough. You know, that's enough self-disclosure already. Sometimes you can do a little bit more because it builds great rapport. You know, if you can find a common ground somewhere, uh, that's really cool. But very often you want to be careful with self-disclosure because it needs to be about the client, not about you. And that is about it, I think, for that one. Again, massively important. Now, I'm not going to go into this one too much in detail, actually. I don't think I'll go into it at all. Human rights. No, just give you an idea on oh, self-reflection. Yeah, very important. Um, reflect your own practice. Uh, if anything, do self-reflection and talk with your supervisor quite often. Uh, it's, it's a necessary thing to make sure you stay on track because we all have blind spots. Uh, I know from experience, you know, to, to do some self-disclosure here. <laughs> I know from experience that uh, education is my is my blind spot, as in, I often go too much into an education mode or into a telling mode or into wanting to help people by giving them advice mode. Yeah, it's just, it's a weak spot of mine. Uh, and I mean well, but it's not counseling. You know, it's more mentoring, it's more coaching. Um, counseling is all about, at least as much as possible, trying to have the client find their own answers. And you can definitely give them advice, but you've got to cloak that in terms of a, hey, look, research shows. You know, that there are three ways of doing this really well. Would you mind if I share those with you? Rather than, uh, let me tell you about three really cool ways that you can do this better. That's advice giving. You know, so as long as you ask the client's permission to to you giving advice, then it's okay. Don't just do it. And I know that's a, that's a blind spot in, in my practice. And I keep talking with my supervisor about that. This is just my natural tendency to sort of educate and teach. Which, which I enjoy doing, but you don't want to do it with the clients. And we'll all have those you know, uh, little bit of pitfall, blind spot stuff. And doing self-reflection on that is, is awesome. 
an ethical practice. I hope you to are or are going to become members of the ACA, the Australian Counselling Association, or PACFA. Yeah, okay. PACFA is good as well. Uh, Sorry, what was the name, the second yeah. one? The other one is PACFA, P-A-C-F-A, P-A-C-F-A, PACFA. And okay. I think it stands for the Psychotherapists and Counselling Federation of Australia or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very similar to, uh, to the ACA. It's just another one. Yeah. Uh, both of them are, are really good. PACFA is a little bit more, as far as I know, it's a little bit more academic. They do a lot of academic stuff. Um, they have you know, researchers on there. They come out with really cool reports every now and then. So checking out the PACFA website is, is, is actually quite a, a good thing to do. I'll just type it in here, actually, see if I can find it for you, Brigitte. Yes. Um, yeah, it's pacfa.org.au, P-A-C-F-A.org.au. Uh, yeah. It's the Psychotherapy and Counseling Federation of Australia. Now, they have uh, lots of really good articles. And again, I, I don't care which one you become a member of. ACA is a little bit more popular uh, because they, they're they a bit more commercial, as I think. And I, I mean that in, in the best sense possible, though. So commercial in the sense that they market themselves quite heavily. Yeah, and, and that's okay. Uh, I like the ACA. I'm an ACA member and have been for a long time. And what I uh, enjoy about that and part of my self-reflection and ethical practices as well, that you you can actually stand up and be proud, uh, be a proud counsellor in the sense, you know, you're accredited. If you are part of that mob, then everyone that works in, in the counselling field knows you're doing at least 10 hours of supervision per year and you're doing at least 24 hours of professional development per year. You know, that's just part of your your requirement to become a member of ACA anyway. So it's a, it's a good thing to, to have. Uh, PACFA, I don't know what their requirements are, but they must be as, as stringent or maybe even a little bit more strict. So either or. And then there's also RCAP, A-R-C-A-P. -A now, that's just a register. That's not an organization. But everyone who's a member of uh, the ACA or PACFA will also be registered in, in the Australian Register of Counseling and Psychotherapists, I think, or Counselors and Psychotherapists. And that gives us, uh, as an industry, gives us good credibility. You know, I think if you are part of an organization that has an official register of registered counselors, uh, then you're doing a good thing. Because, you know, counseling still, uh, as per the 24th of March 2017, is still an unregulated industry. Anyone can just buy a shingle, hammer it on their door, and write counselor on this, on it, and no one can stop you. You know, it's... So... Being part of uh, being a registered counsellor, calling yourself a registered counsellor, uh, means that you are registered, for instance, with RCAP through the ACA or PACFA, and it gives the industry a bit more oomph. And I find that part of, of an ethical practice. I think we all should do that because it means that at least you comply with the minimum quality standards, yeah, and, and that's a good thing. And we should do it already now, or should we write? Well, you can, hey. No, you can become a student member. So for all the students, you can definitely uh, start off in a student membership. Uh, a little bit cheaper as well. Uh, but you're definitely, yeah, so you're definitely already a member. Uh, yeah, no, do it. Yeah, you can already do it now. Um, and um, also, Mark, you um, and Bridget, you get a magazine. Yep. That comes out, Australian oh, Council. Yeah, you got to sign up for that one. Uh, it's, I yeah. think it's $60 a year for four yeah. issues. Yeah. comes out four times a year, so Counselling Australia. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a good point, Dale. Uh, that, that's a good periodical. Uh, I enjoy reading it. There's good stuff in there. You yeah. know, so keep studying anyway. But, yeah, if you know you sign up for the ACA, you know you're going to get, or at least if you sign up for the, the subscription for the mag as well, I, I would. Now, for $60 extra, you get that mag four times a year. It's great personal and professional development. Okay. So, yeah, look into a student membership. I think uh, I've, have a, I've got a couple of classroom students here that are uh, you know, already student member of the ACA. It works a treat. It's good. And then you'll be on that RCAP. You can be on the RCAP as well, the Australian Register, which uh, yeah. can call yourself a registered counsellor once you're done. And I think that gives the, the industry uh, extra credibility, which is what it's all about. Because there's, there's plenty of charlatan counsellors out there, yeah. and uh, I don't want to be part of that. Um, and that, like I said, I wasn't going to do much with that. Session four, section four. No, just read through it. And it'll be all fine. Um, what I would say, and that's just a summary of that one, of that section four, have a good old read of the ACA Code of Ethics and the PACFA Code of Ethics. 
Uh, those are really your guidelines as to how you should run your practice. So as, as long as you can use them as your sort of professional Bible in the sense of, okay, what do I need to do in order to run a good practice? Check out the Code of Ethics. Uh, there's not too much uh, proper legal stuff out there in terms of acts, even though it's getting stronger and stronger. There are definitely acts applicable to us. You know, we, we need to uh, stick to, to OHS regulations. We need to stick to non-discrimination acts. We need to stick to privacy acts and freedom of information acts. But they're sort of indirectly applicable to us. There's not something that, that really applies to us directly other than the code of ethics. So just have a, have a good old read of them and then make sure you, you take them in and make them part of your practice, really. Uh, I got them lying around in my office somewhere. <laughs> I say somewhere. Oh, I would have to look. <laughs> All right, now that is yeah, pretty much my view of, of 002. Uh, there's not much more to it. Um, again, other than just highlighting yellow, green, and blue, that it's really important to know your micro skills and interview skills because they will make uh, yeah, about 60 to 70 percent of your therapeutic outcomes. So definitely work on those in your practicals and in, in, in daily life. You know, open questioning, reflecting, paraphrasing, summarizing. Use your specialty, uh, you know, your specialist communication skills and, and look at your own body language and that of your clients and, and look at the glory of videos. That's, uh, it's definitely good fun. Yeah. Any questions on that? No, uh, I'm fine. Thank yeah, you're you. fine. Keep going. All right, all good. No. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for being my, uh, my partners here. <laughs> I didn't feel as alone as I did last time anyway, so that was good. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I'll stop presenting. Um, yeah, and unless you've got questions, then uh, we'll call it a day. Okay, thank you, Mark. No problem. All right, speak soon. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, and have a great weekend. You too. See ya. Bye bye. bye.